Today we are going to be continuing through these early verses of the 18th chapter of John's Gospel. And I want to just go back a little bit to where we left off last Lord's Day and then move uh, further into the passage with a few thoughts this morning. The theme for today will be the controlling factor, or if you like, when enough is not enough. Let's take a, a moment to unite our hearts in prayer. Our loving Father, we thank you once again for the open word. We are a privileged people to be able to come together like this in public, to read your word together, to meditate upon its truth, and to be aware that you have promised to bless your word to all our hearts. But most of all, we thank you that we are privileged in that you have declared that where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst. And while our hearts are thrilled in the reading of your word, we know that we are abundantly blessed when we feel your presence in and through the word and know that you are here. Help us today to focus upon the scriptures. Remove all distractions from us. May our concentration be sincere and serious. And may we leave this gathering knowing it was good to be here because here we have met afresh with you. May Christ be honored in our thoughts and in our hearts. In our Savior's name we pray. Amen. Now last uh, Lord's Day you will recall that we noted three main thoughts that emerged in the reading of these first 13 verses of the 18th chapter of John's Gospel. In verse 3, we have a description of his apprehension. And we're going to be touching on that a little bit more today. But in the main, we're going to move through into the fifth verse, where we have a designation of his affirmation. So having uh, been confronted and accosted by those who came to make the arrest, in verse 5 we have Jesus now affirming not only his name, but who he is, not only in natural, physical terms, Jesus of Nazareth, but also in the dynamics of the dynamic authority and power of his name as the, third, the second person of the Trinity. That's the thought we will develop a little more this morning. And then coming down into verse 11, we have a declaration of his anticipation. Remember, we are now on the verge of Calvary. We are moving beneath its shadow, coming out from the shadows of the garden. Christ will soon be overwhelmed by the shadow of the cross. And in verse 11 we read, Jesus said to Peter, Shall I not drink the cup which my Father has given me? So here we have the confirmation of what this passage of Scripture relates to us in terms of of its glorious teaching. This is the purpose behind the actions that take place in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, we noted in our study last Lord's Day, just as we were coming towards a close, and I felt sorry for you, and uh, I didn't want to prolong the message last week, but there is a point that I really must come back to this morning. And uh, then we'll move through as the Lord leads us. You may recall that up in verse 3, the first part of the verse, we noted those sad and tragic 
words. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops. We link that back to an earlier verse in the period in which Christ was up in the upper room with his disciples. And there we read, Judas received the bread. Here we have the contrast of a profession without the reality of a possession. The same one who put forth his hand to receive from Christ the bread, marking an identification with him in his death, now comes back into view, having gone out from the upper room into the darkness of the night, to meet up with and to secure the betrayal of Jesus, now Judas returns, this time with a detachment of soldiers. He has received, on the one hand, from Jesus, and now, on the other hand, from those who are seeking the death of the Savior. And how often are we confronted in the reality of our lives with those who have made profession of faith in Christ. And somewhere along the way, they have reversed, as it were, the sentiments of their heart and the affections of their will, and they have now moved into the mode of denial of the very Christ whom they once professed. There are many occasions where I reminisce over almost 50 years of ministry. I have little pieces of information collected over the years that relate to those uh, funerals that I've conducted and weddings that I've uh, conducted and so on. And as I sit and look through these and reminisce, several times I reflect upon those who once walked well with Christ, and now their lives are shipwrecked. They're upon the rocks of worldliness, and the very sentiment of their heart opposes the things that once they affirmed in their heart and in their worship. What a tragedy that is. Come with me to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And we want to read just two verses 18 and 19. 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. The spirit of Antichrist already at work. Those who are professing to be followers of Jesus have been caught up in and overwhelmed by the spirit of the age and of the world. And they have discovered that the true intentions of their heart have never been fully persuaded in the things of Christ. And they have gone along in the motions of serving Jesus. They have mingled with God's people. They have observed the activity of the divine interventions of God into the world. They have worked their way into the church and through the church. and They have partaken of the Lord's Supper. They have done all of these things in the name of Christ. 
and yet ultimately they have fallen away and they've spurned the grace that once they professed and when it came to that moment of their death there was no recollection in their mind or heart of the things of God and they've died in the coldness and the darkness of their sin what a tragedy and yet we live in an age of deception and we know that there are many who profess to be followers of Christ and we will see them turning up in the most vile of associations. They will take their stand with those who outwardly deny Christ and they will do it in the name of their religion. Remember what Jesus warns us in Matthew chapter 7. You can read there in verses 15 all the way through to verse 23. Of those who have this profession and those around them observe their lives and they think that they are all right in terms of their spiritual standing. But when it comes to the end and they knock on the door of heaven and cry, Lord, Lord, open unto us. In your name we have done all of these mighty things. And back will come the response of heaven, Depart from me, I never knew you. Oh, the significance of those words. For the Bible tells us this is the very foundation upon which the church is established. The Lord knows those who are his. And no amount of profession will overcome the reality that we will never get to heaven on profession of faith. We will only be in heaven by the possession of the mercy and the grace of God in our heart. There are many today who rely upon a misguided notion of the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. They presume upon profession. Turn with me to John chapter 10 for a moment. And let's look at John chapter 10, verses 27 to 30. And mark well these words of Jesus. John 10, verse 27. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. The prophet Isaiah declared, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But now Jesus declares, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Notice the proper pronouns that are listed right through this segment of Scripture. My sheep, they hear my voice. They follow me. And I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man Snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Oh, the glorious consolation of this promise of Scripture. Those who are His are eternally secure. But note how the text breaks down, first of all, in verse 27, the first part, we have the confirming principle, my sheep hear my voice. Not emotion, not conscience, not the will to be included and go along with our peers, but my sheep Hear my voice. How does God speak to us? 
through his word. That word which penetrates the darkness of our minds and the solid resistance of our heart and opens us up like the heart of Lydia to receive the word of God. When we come under the word, we come under the compelling nature of that word. We are convinced of our sin. We are awakened to our sense of lostness. And we hear his voice, not the voice of a preacher calling us to repentance, not the voice of one inviting us to give our all to Christ. But above and beyond all of this, we hear his voice penetrating deep into our very soul and being. Then notice the second thought. Not only do we see the confirming principle, but we have the convincing promise. Second part of verse 27, And I know them. Known on what score, by what account? Does he know us simply because we have responded in a meeting or a service or by invitation? No, he knows us because there in eternity past before the world ever began, Christ was the Lamb of God slain. And as he came into the world, he came because the Father in John 17 had given him his sheep. We were known to him before the foundation of the world. Those who are known will respond to him. How will they respond? Look at this third part of that text, verse 27. And they follow me. There is the committed process. They follow me. What did Jesus say? If any man comes after me, if any man follows me, what will he do? He will deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You see, you cannot follow Jesus if you don't deny self. You cannot have eternal life if you don't follow Jesus. So in order to follow, you must deny yourself. And if you deny yourself and follow Christ, then you will have eternal life. What do his sheep do? They follow me. There are places that Jesus won't lead you. There are places where he will lead you. There are things he will not lead you to do, and there are things that he will lead you to do. There is a marked contrast between the leading of the world and the leading of Christ. And we cannot follow Christ here and then follow the world there. You cannot have a profession of faith in Jesus and identify with his cause here and then when it suits you go off into the world and follow the world. If we deny ourselves it means we follow Christ all the way. Every step of the way. And it's not just a profession. There is something in our heart that stirs us, that drives us, that compels us. There is something that lives in us, that gives us the energy, the enthusiasm, the drive to follow Christ. And when the world are off doing their thing, we know where our heart lies. 
We want to be with the people of God. We want to be engaged in the things of God. We want to be saturated by the atmosphere of the presence of God. We hunger, we thirst after righteousness. And it's not just a matter of trying to put on or clothe ourselves in the folds of Christ's righteousness if perchance we can make it through to heaven. But we desire to be involved. It's our very life, it's our being, like Paul declared, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If your lifestyle leads you into sin. If your lifestyle leads to a denial of God's Word in your heart, if your lifestyle leads you in contradiction to Scripture, then dare I suggest today that you are none of His. If you are not following Him, then you have no guarantee of eternal life. You have no assurance that you are one of his if you were not following him. Judas received the bread of communion, but he also received the band of soldiers. And come with me into chapter 17 and look of John's Gospel, and look at verse 12. John 17 and verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you give me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, except the son of perdition, that the Scriptures might be fulfilled. Twelve disciples... They were all there at every opportunity. And sitting in the upper room, they all took part in the Lord's Supper. They all received the bread and the wine. But eleven were saved and one was lost. The disciples began to ask, Lord, is it I? Is it I? And we are encouraged to search out our hearts. Do not presume upon a profession of faith to get you to heaven. Remember in the little book of James, chapter 2 and verse 19, we're told that the demons believe and tremble. Now look at verse 3 of John chapter 18, how Judas arrived in the garden. We're going to pick this up in just a moment, but notice in verse 3 of John 18, there is Judas himself. There is with him a detachment of troops. There are officers from the chief priests and Pharisees. So we have Judas who will betray him. The detachment of Roman soldiers, Gentiles, and we have the officers from the chief priests and Pharisees. We have the Jews. Judas now shows his true colors. He is surrounded by Christ rejectors. And they come with their lanterns, their torches, and their weapons to take Jesus off to his death. It reminds us a little bit of 1 Samuel 17. Remember when David went out against Goliath. And when the matchup was discovered or, or was set up and the scene was all ready for the action. Remember in verse 45 of 1 Samuel 17. David said to the giant, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. These, of course, all been weapons of warfare. And then he continued, But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. 
Our warfare, our battles are not fought against flesh and blood, but against uh, spiritual darkness, spiritual wickedness, the powers of this world, Ephesians 6 and 12, sets it out clearly. Paul in 2 Corinthians 10 and 4 declares, The weapons of our warfare, therefore, are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of the strongholds of Satan. So here we have this mixed match of all of these opposers of Christ, enemies of the truth, coming out to meet Jesus in the garden to create the grounds and the means of his arrest. And they're coming with all of their physical might against the one who was not coming to them in the name of the Lord. He is the Lord. The Lord over all lords and the king over all kings. Now look what happens in the context, and we're going to come back and break this down in a little more detail. But look at verse 4 of John 18. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward. Now here he is without a spear, without a sword, without a javelin, without any implement of man's device for protection or attack, he went forward. Now look at verse 6. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back. That sounds a little strange, doesn't it? All these soldiers, they draw back. And Jesus, as it were, on his own, steps forward. But there's a reason for that. And as we penetrate this particular illustration, we discover something of the profound teaching and truths that emerge from this passage of Scripture. A little bit more, first of all, about this group that come. We could uh, in a sense, refer to them as the mob. And we do that carefully because this is not, as we will see, a mob that in a frenzy, as they have been whipped up in the excitement of um, uh, the authorities to rein their anger and agitation and frustration upon Jesus, this is not that kind of mob who come to... Um, arrest Jesus. This is a carefully planned operation. This is the SWAT squad coming in to do a military exercise with precision to be carried out as swiftly and as efficiently as possible before any intrusions by the followers of Christ can affect the uh, arrest. And so, in the passage, we are told something about this group, the mob, that now come to arrest Jesus. If you go over into Matthew 27 and verse 47, you will read that there Matthew simply refers to this company as a great multitude. We come over into Mark's Gospel, chapter 14 and verse 43, and there we read that it was a great multitude. We come over into Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, verse 47, and here we read that it was simply a multitude. Now, is there a difference between a multitude and a great multitude? Well, that's how it is described in the Synoptic Gospels. Mark and Matthew give us a little bit of a clue into who they were, but Luke says absolutely nothing. Luke is silent. He doesn't describe anything about this company that come to arrest Jesus in the garden. 
Matthew and Mark report that they came with swords and clubs. So from that we have an understanding. The swords belonged to soldiers. And the clubs, or in our modern language, we refer to them as batons or batons. And they belong to the police. So we have this mix of soldiers and official police officers who are among this group that come. John, however, is more specific. And if you look at verse 3, you'll see how John describes the group that have come. He tells us, first of all, that he had, Judas had received a, and the word translated here is, a detachment of troops. Now, the word that's translated detachment in the New King James is the word cohort. The cohort being one-tenth of a legion of soldiers. Now, there are 6,000 soldiers in a legion. So, the soldiers who came into the garden would have averaged around 600 in total. So, this is some major exercise. One would have to ask, what is the reason for their being here? Well, in all probability, uh, these were the soldiers that were used to stem any riots that may have taken place amongst the Jews, over which the Romans had control. There was a garrison stationed in this area, and at any sign of a resistance to the Roman authorities, these soldiers would be sent out in detachments to quell the riots of the Jews. So they want to make sure that others don't come to interfere or to rescue Jesus. So they make sure by sending 600 soldiers. Now let's look a little further into verse 3. And officers from the chief priests. Now, who were these officers from the chief priests? The officers were those who were under the control of that group of Sanhedrin council members known to us and having appeared quite frequently in the Gospels as the sad you sees. And you'll note that when we come to the next little part where it specifies and Pharisees. The Sanhedrin was made up of Sadducees and Pharisees, with the Sadducees having the main say. And what was the issue that the Sadducees had with the teaching of Jesus? It was the teaching about the resurrection. And so here they now are represented, and the Pharisees are represented. So this is not a mob stirred up by the people. It is a highly organized and officially sanctioned group. This was not a spur-of-the-moment decision. It was a calculated well planned and now executed with a degree of precision. Come back into chapter 11 of John's Gospel and look at verse 57. Now both the chief priests, that's the Sadducees, and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they might seize him. So there was the invitation to Judas. Let's offer some money for anyone who can show us where Jesus is and bring us to him in a place and in a manner where we can arrest him without fuss. And Judas 
has locked that away in his head. And now when the moment comes, he picks up his 30 pieces of silver and he leads them into the garden to arrest Jesus. You'll see similar over in Luke 22 and verse 52. This was a movement, this was something that they were working on. When we hear on the news of the arrest or of a, a raid on a certain home, we often hear they were known to the police. And we read into that, that the police were keeping watch on them. They were monitoring their movements. And that's how it was with Jesus. And now they sense that this is the moment that they can execute their will on Jesus. Little do they understand that this is the very moment that Jesus has come for. This is why he is here upon the earth. This is not their moment. It's his moment. And so this concentrated and concerted effort by all parties to bring to an end the unwanted revelation of Jesus has come. And under artificial light, you will see how they come in verse 3 with lanterns, torches, and weapons. As they come with their artificial light, it is their desire to put out the light of the world. But notice how they come together. Verse 4, Jesus went forward and said to them, It is his intention that his arrest be secured without incident or resistance, because the time has come. Verse 4, Jesus went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? He initiates the contact. He is guiding the process. Be it one or be it a thousand who come to arrest him, the outcome will be the same because now is the moment. Notice the basis upon which this is controlled. Look at verse 4, the first part. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward. He knew what lies ahead, and he knew that now is the time. If you want to flick back through John's Gospel, you will notice how this knowledge of Christ is always to the fore. First chapter of John's Gospel, verse 42. You'll read there how Jesus knew all about Peter. In verse 47 and 48 of chapter 1, he knew all about Nathaniel. In chapter 2, verse 24 and 25, he knew all about all men. In chapter 4, verse 29, he knew all about the woman at the well. In chapter 6, verse 64, he knew who would not believe, and he knew who would betray him. And then over in chapter 13 and verse 1, he knew that the time of his departure is at hand. Now come over into chapter 21 of John's Gospel and look at verse 17. And here is the confession of Peter. Peter has been reinstated. He has now been recommissioned for service. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And look at verse 17. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, Feed my sheep. You know all things. But coming back into John chapter 13 and verse 3, 
Perhaps this is the text that brings it all together. Look at verse 3 of John 13. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God. We come back into chapter 18, and we again read verse 4. Jesus, knowing all things that would come upon him. Jesus knew that all power, all authority has been placed in his hand. Yet he knows that these soldiers and leaders of the Jews have come to arrest him. And he will be marched into Pilate's judgment hall. He will stand as an accused, condemned prisoner, a common criminal. He will at last be beaten and then taken out to the cross, and there he will die. The Son of God, by sinful hands, taken and nailed to a cross. But the one to whom belongs all power, knowing what would happen to him, steps forward to meet the conquest, the conflict, and the foe. And so in verse 4, Jesus knew all things that would come upon him. How did he know all things? He knew because they were decreed by God. He knew all things because they were agreed to and confirmed by Christ in eternity past. He knew all things because they had been predicted and presented all through the Old Testament Scriptures. And now, in order that the Scriptures might be fulfilled, the purpose of God might be accomplished, Christ is prepared to go to the cross to die. So Jesus, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward. Not just went forth, but went forward. This was the stride of sovereignty. He knew why this crowd had gathered here. He knew the reason for their coming, and yet he asked, Whom are you seeking? In verse 4 of John 18, Whom are you seeking? And notice in verse 5, they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. This was a two-pronged exclamation. Two things are meant in the response of Jesus. One, it is a mark of identification. Secondly, it is the evidence of humiliation. It was supposed that nothing good could ever come out of Nazareth. And so they asked him, to identify Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus boldly asserts, I am he. Verse 6, they drew back and fell to the ground. Not only is this a mark of identification, a sign of humiliation, but now it becomes a vindication. I am he. Even in this response, he fulfills scripture. In Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, you will read, But you, Bethlehem, Epaphra, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. I am 
he. Now, what does this mean? Well, our time has gone. We'll come back, God willing, next Lord's Day. And we want to note that there are three ways, three ways, in which this term is used in Scripture. And in order for us to get the full impact and to understand the reason why these who had come to arrest him drew back and then fell before him, we're going to note the reason why that happened, and it's all conveyed in these words, I am he. What happened to Paul on the road to Damascus when he realized he was in the presence of Christ? He fell down. What happens to sinners when they recognize their lostness, their sinfulness, and suddenly they're confronted by the beauty and the glory and the power and the authority of Christ. What do they do? They fall down. Have you bowed your knee to Christ? Much better to do that here and now, because a day is coming when before his name every knee shall bow. And if you have not bowed your knee to Christ here and now, it will be too late. You'll cry with those who say, Lord, we have preached in your name. In your name we've done all these good and wonderful things. And back will come the response, Depart, I never knew you. If you feel the tug of the Spirit in your heart this morning, don't resist. Yield to Jesus. Come to know him, whom to know is life eternal. Let's pray. Our loving Father, we thank you again for your word. We pray your blessing to be upon its proclamation and in the assimilation of its truth. May our hearts be illuminated May our spirits be fascinated as we see the beauty of our Lord. And may the word take effect and accomplish in our heart that which you please and prosper in the very thing to which you have sent it. In our Saviour's name we pray. Amen.